The third man hunted by police has been nicknamed Psycho. I was 19 when I was arrested. When I was a, a young lad, my life was fairly ordinary. I started developing an anger problem in my mid to late teens. I think it's true to say that I was a very reckless and dangerous person. When I was a student in Leeds, I was robbed on the street, so I planned revenge. made a homemade bomb and placed it near where they hung out in the hope that they would be injured. Police! Get down! The police found the device and defused it, thankfully. Search of the house found numerous weapons and bomb-making equipment. My life as I knew it was over. I was 19 when I was arrested. A life sentence could mean dying in custody. The only real way out was to escape. The easiest option for any prisoner to escape is to escape from a prison van. I was being transported to a maximum security prison somewhere in England. I knew it was now or never. The officer in front of me was in possession of both sets of cuff keys. Escape would depend on if I could terrify him enough into giving me those keys. I previously concealed a hypodermic needle. Stabbed myself in the arm. Wake up! Stop the van! Stop the van! I said, you know that I've got AIDS. If you don't take these handcuffs off, I'm gonna stab you all. I didn't have AIDS, but he took one look at the blood and the needle told the driver, and then we raced to the police station, which I knew was the procedure. When we got to the police station, the officer who had the security keys ran away. He'd left the door wide open. Come on, let's go, come on, come on, come on! Oh. I knew that at that point, I wasn't really going anywhere. I had no idea where they were going. The further south I drove, I realized that there was only one prison it could be. Parkhurst has got a very bad reputation. It's a violent place. It's accepted people convicted of murder, serial killing, terrorism-related offences. It was just horrendous. It's just a general atmosphere of extreme misery and despair. Straight away, I started to scout around the prison, looking for a way out. The more I looked, the tougher it seemed. I had to get past the guards, the cameras. 
over a 20-foot steel fence with razor wire, then over a 24-foot wall with a special grapple-proof dome built onto the top. And it's on an island, so you've got the added difficulty of getting over the water to the mainland. The only chink in the armor of Parkhurst was that they were having building renovation work done. Outside my window, there'd be lorries and diggers driving up and down day by day inside the prison itself. If I could find a way to take a vehicle as it was leaving, then that could be my ticket out. I'd known Keith at the previous prison I was at. Keith was a life sentence prisoner convicted of murdering the wife of a supermarket owner in the early 1990s. We struck up a conversation. Keith began to mention the possibility of escaping from Parkhurst. I considered Keith to be a completely trustworthy character, otherwise I never would have discussed any such thing with him. Keith had been watching the guards, and particular watching the locks, and had noticed that due to a recent lock change in the prison, all of the new locks had been replaced with color-coded locks. Some were green, some were red. Not many of the doors around the prison had a green lock, but lots of them had red locks. I'd assumed that the security at Parkhurst was a lot more complicated than that. Thought I wasn't going to accept his word for it. I want to see him myself. I spent a day or two walking round. Virtually every lock in that prison was colour-coded. If you had a red key, you could get to 95% of the prison. If you had a red key, you could walk into the vehicle compound. If I can get into one of those lorries, I can get out of this jail. we began to seriously discuss planning an escape. Keith said a key was basically just a shaped piece of metal. All we needed to concentrate on was making that shaped piece of metal. He managed to convince me that I had the ability to make a key for those locks. The prison ran lots of courses, so I applied for a place in a metal workshop class. We were watched by the guards all the time, so I had to be careful. But the workshop gave me access to what I needed to make the key. In the music room, they had a door with a red lock. Getting a visual picture of how that lock works was the first big challenge for me. I would stare at it for hours at a time. I had to effectively design that lock mentally so that I could break it. And the more I looked at that lock, the more complicated I realized it was. But some of that information I needed came from prison officers inadvertently. When they would fall asleep with the keys out, you can get a certain amount of information there from a key by how it looks. The rough shapes of the metal were relatively easy to cut out using the proper tools in the workshop. But to cut the finer detail into a key can take many hours, and you can't do that in a workshop because somebody will see what you're doing. So that had to be done in my cell.
I was extremely nervous every time I took that key out. There's no excuse that you can have to have a copy of a key in prison. That's big trouble. It's a very laborious task. I was worried about making too much noise as well. It's a very distinctive sound. Very slowly, over several weeks, I managed to cut and shape the key that could potentially open most of the locks inside the prison. The problem was you only have to get one of those patterns slightly wrong and the key won't work. The music room was the best place to test that key. Right, who fancies a cup of tea? Oh yeah, that'd be lovely. People would come and go into the music room during a class, but during tea breaks and so on, the staff and prisoners would wander off. Put the key in the lock. Fitted perfectly. And then it's kind of went a bit funny. There was something wrong. The key was bending. I tried to take the key out of the lock. That key was stuck. I knew that if a guard came back and saw that key, we were finished. There were members of staff coming in and out of the room. And all of the time, there was a half-made key stuck in that lock with me sat there next to it. It just felt like I was there for about a thousand years, just waiting for people to go away. I managed to fish the key out, and I realized that I needed a much, much stronger key. I had to remake that key from scratch with a much stronger metal, using steel. Cutting through steel with an inch-long piece of hacksaw is really very difficult. It cut my fingers up quite badly. So I had to just do it very slowly over a period of a week or so. Once I was happy, I took it back to the music room. I waited till the coast was clear. Put the key in the lock. Gave it a twist. I felt pretty elated. The entire prison was open. We could go anywhere we wanted. Then I got some really bad news. The rumor was two prisoners had been caught planning to steal a digger or a lorry and escape via the building compound, exactly the same way as we were planning to. All of the security was upgraded. I thought, that's it. We're not going to get out of this jail. We discussed what our next step should be. Me and Keith decided to try and think of an alternative way out of the prison using that key. 
I knew our key would open many of the internal doors, but I wasn't sure which ones. I decided to build a mental map of the whole prison. The key could open doors to the music room, the gym and the metal workshop. And from all three, we could get access to the yard. But we still had to get past the fence and then scale the wall to get out of the prison. Ultimately, we needed to get over a 20-foot steel fence with razor wire, and then a 24-foot concrete wall with a special grapple-proof dome built onto the top. The only way over that wall, realistically, was to make a strong ladder and climb over it. Building a 24-foot ladder was a serious challenge. It seemed impossible. I thought about it for hours. But then I realized that the answer to everything lay in that metal workshop. We could construct a ladder during classes and hide it in parts all around the workshop. Then using our key, we could go at night to the workshop, assemble the ladder, grab the wire cutters, and from there, cut the fence and scale the wall. The only problem was I'd just been banned from the metal workshop. I'd fallen out with the instructor about making some metalwork sculptures I was working on. He didn't like my attitude. I didn't like him, and he was in charge, so I got banned. We needed to recruit somebody else to make that ladder for us. Only one man fitted the bill of being reliable and willing to escape, and that was Andy Roger. Andy was serving life for killing a security guard. He could be there for 20 years, and he was determined to escape. As Andy was the workshop orderly, he had a trusted position and had access to everything in that workshop, which made him ideal for that job. Staff assumed that Andy was just simply working away at various prison contraptions that were needed. He was never questioned about the work he was doing. The ladder basically consisted of six lengths of 12-foot central heating pipe connected together to form a 24-foot structure. It took approximately three weeks to make. It was hidden in parts all around the workshop. The plan was to assemble the ladder on the night. We all agreed we should start our escape from the gym because it had the weakest security. But it also presented us with a problem. There were two doors from the gym that we knew we could open, but outside there was a third gate which I hadn't been able to test. We needed to get through that gate to reach the metal workshop, grab the ladder and scale the fence and wall. Despite not knowing if the third gate would open, we all agreed going from the gym was our best bet. Then we got disastrous news. Andy found out that the workshop was to be relocated. We wouldn't be able to access it anymore. The site they were moving it to had a different set of locks. We'd have to start again with making a whole new set of keys. That meant that we had to move as fast as we could whilst we had access to that workshop and our equipment. So we go. And we decided to go. The gym was full that night. 
There was a lot of prisoners walking about. We were all in a state of nerves. The plan was that I would run on ahead, unlock all of the gates, then run back to the gym, give Andy and Keith the nod. They would run to the workshop, and I would follow them on and lock all the gates behind them. There'll be a roll check in the gym in half an hour. We were ready to go. After I checked that the coast was clear, I put in the key, and it turned and opened first time perfectly. The key worked on the gate behind it too. So far, so good. I then ran towards the third gate. Our entire escape really depended on whether we were going to get through that gate or not. Without access to the exercise yard, we would never get to the workshop. All our equipment would have been made with no purpose. It wouldn't turn. Tried to fiddle with it and jiggle that key in the lock. Finally, the key worked. I ran back to the gym. Keith and Andy were waiting to go. We had 25 minutes to make that ladder, cut a hole in the fence, and climb over that wall. We knew that there was a few seconds when anyone monitoring those cameras would have seen us. The first sign we would know about it was when officers would run onto the yard. 20 feet away from the workshop door, there's a rattle of a gate. Out comes an officer with a drug dog. The drug dog runs right in front of me, no more than about 20 feet away. Looked in my direction. It looked into the shadows where I was, and I was staring back at it. And I thought, that's it, we're caught. That's it, it's over. The handler whistled for his dog. I couldn't believe it. We can't hang around any longer. Time's going. There'll be a roll check in the gym within the next 20 minutes. We got into the workshop. Andy began to assemble the ladder. I grabbed some wire cutters to get through the fence and some electrical flex to use as a rope to lower us down the other side of the wall. Within about 10 minutes, the ladder was built. The adrenaline was going really strong at that point. We just all ran hell for leather. The next job is to hit that fence, cut through it as fast as we could, and get that ladder up against the wall. I was fully expecting any minutes, dozens of staff to come running in our direction. We were now facing the last barrier that prison had to offer, the wall.
I was almost sick with worry. We didn't know how much weight that ladder was going to take. When I got to the top of it, I then had to very quickly lash that electrical flex to the ladder. Whilst Andy climbed up, I prepared to go down the other side. It was a very strange feeling when I jumped down there and I didn't quite believe that we'd done it. We had no time to really absorb that experience. We just thought, we're off. The next stage was obviously getting off the island. Keith had explained to me that he did have a pilot's license and that there were three airfields on the Isle of Wight, all within five minutes' drive. Our next objective was to get a car. Take that car to Sandown Airfield. Keith would then hotwire the aeroplane. We would get it started and fly to the mainland. By this time, it's around about five to seven at night. We knew that at seven o'clock there'd be a roll call, so we had at most five minutes before staff would start to suspect that we were missing from the prison. Keith was very good at thinking on his feet and said, let's get a taxi. And at first I thought that was an absolutely balmy idea until Keith explained. He says, well, we're just ordinary people walking down the street. We had some money on us, which we'd also smuggled into the prison. And then it made sense. We'll get a taxi, and within five minutes, we could be away from the jail. We picked up a taxi almost immediately. It was in the taxi that I realized that the alarm was probably being raised. I received news of the breakout very shortly after eight o'clock in the evening. Right. I was fully aware that any escapee from Parkers was likely to be a very, very dangerous individual. Three of them together, incredibly dangerous. I gave immediate instructions to mobilize 250 officers to make a systematic search of the island. To man the ferry ports on the mainland, to place a ring of steel around the island to prevent the prisoners leaving. The Isle of Wight becomes a mini Alcatraz. They can escape from the prison, but they're contained on an island. We pulled up and then all walked around to Sandown Airfield. I was absolutely baffled when I got to that airfield. It looked like a farmer's field and it was in complete darkness aside from one night watchman sat in a small hut. We couldn't let that man see us. It was far too suspicious to see anyone on that airfield prowling around at night. Keith opened up the cockpit, started performing some checks on the airplane. What's taking so long? There was no battery in the plane. He said, I'm sorry, lad, we'll have to try another one. If we couldn't get that one running, we knew that we were basically sunk and trapped on that island. The dashboard immediately lit up. My heart leapt, and I thought, fantastic, let's get that in the air. 
Unfortunately, Keith said that that was just a, a built-in mechanism to check the plane. We still had to turn it on the way you would turn on a car engine. Good. And this is where we hit problems. The lock was far too complicated. At this point, I started to panic. My heart sunk because I knew if we weren't leaving the island anytime soon. We decided to abandon the airplane idea. Gonna go on the boat. Gonna use the boat. Let's go. Let's go. I was absolutely gutted that we had to leave that airplane standing in the field. What made it worse was that I knew the police would now be looking for us. When I heard about the escape, they issued a code word. When you receive that code phrase, you immediately go to the nearest police station. We basically had a very quick briefing on the hoof. My initial reaction was, these blokes have got to be caught. Highly dangerous individual. When you know they're in for murder, you know they've got nothing to lose. 45-year-old Keith Rose had threatened revenge. Andy Roger was serving life after bludgeoning to death a security The third man guard. being hunted by police has been nicknamed Psycho. We'd been walking for about four or five hours. We hadn't had anything to eat or drink for maybe 12 hours. We were just absolutely shattered. We found an abandoned shed. That night was absolutely freezing cold and there wasn't really that much shelter except a large sheet of plastic. The wind was blowing through the gaps in the wood and we just shivered all night. Search teams have now moved to the sparsely populated south coast of the island. They'll be checking miles of coastline and scores of isolated properties. I knew the search operation was going to be looking for a needle in a haystack. These were scheming, devious, dangerous individuals. My concerns were these three people could take hostages and hold up. We had to be sure every time that we searched the property that we were thoroughly searching it and others within the household weren't being held hostage. One of the pieces of kit that I'd taken with me was a shaving kit. Keith cut off his beard. Keith looked so different that I didn't even recognize him. And we knew that that was a big advantage. That enabled him to go out and buy provisions from the local shops. I thought if Keith was captured, it wouldn't take long for them to start searching nearby and quickly find us. Before Keith left, we agreed that if he didn't return within an hour and a half, we would have to assume that he'd been taken. And at that point, we would leave the shed and go our separate ways. There are quite a few isolated houses and dwellings in the countryside around the prison. There was one isolated house where an alarm had gone off. In the back of your mind, you're always thinking, are they in there? Sitting in that shed was absolutely horrible. I was worried the police might find us at any time. That was my worst nightmare.
police alarm. It was a total false alarm. We were frustrated. You've got to catch them. You've just got to keep going and going and going. Andy and Keith were certainly becoming more and more anxious about moving. I wanted to stay. My opinion was that the, the longer we waited, the better the chances we had when we tried to find a boat. Keith suggested that he would ring a friend of his who may be able to come to the island and put us in the back of a van and take us off the island that way. Now, I didn't like that idea at all. I had no idea who this man was. I'd never met him. I'd said to Keith, do not ring anyone. Keith went out that night to get food and drink like he had before. And when he returned, he told us that he had phoned his friend. I knew you'd done something. I knew you'd done something stupid. I, asked you I was furious. There was absolutely no need to let anyone know where we were or the state we were in. We're sitting ducks if we stay here. I decided we needed to leave that shed straight away, get a boat from the marina, and get off this island. Now. We started walking separately. Andy and Keith walked ahead. The idea behind that was that if any of us were spotted, at least the other two would have a chance to run off. I'd been given the responsibility to take a patrol out. As we came up the slope of the road, I saw two men walking with their heads down. Come back here. I decided to go it alone. Whatever was gonna happen now, Andy and Keith were on their own. I shouted, urgent, urgent, urgent. We have detained Rose. We have detained Rogers. Williams has run off. I knew dog handlers would now be en route. I also ordered the aircraft because I knew he had thermal imaging. I was concentrating on running as fast as I could for as long as I could. That was the only thing that was going through my head. Keep going. They haven't got you yet. Keep going. I could see several boats, all of about the right size. I ran to a boat which had hanging from its back a small dinghy. I could see torches coming. It was only a matter of minutes before the police tracked me down. The police were heading through the trees. I started trying to undo the knots. They were very, very securely tied. It was a freezing night. My hands were frozen and the ropes were frozen. And I just couldn't get my fingers inside these knots to undo them. It didn't take us long to get to the scene. The dog immediately picked up a track. We continued towards the marina. Our assumption was that he was heading towards the marina, maybe to find a boat to get to the mainland. Over the trees, I could see a very bright white light heading my direction, the distinctive sound of a helicopter. The big problem with a helicopter 
was its thermal camera, which means that it can see the body heat. It can spot you under any kind of hiding. The only realistic way I could think of of avoiding that thermal camera was to get under the water. The water was absolutely freezing. It was a physical shock. My hope at that point was that the helicopter would sweep over the area, and if it didn't spot anything, it would carry on further up the coast. At that point, I could climb out of the water and double back the way I'd come. Kept my fingers crossed that that helicopter was going to move on. I could feel my whole body starting to shut down. And the pain soon became absolutely excruciating. I started to actually lose my senses. My hearing started to go. My eyesight started to go. I couldn't feel my arms and legs anymore. And I'd stopped shivering, which I knew was a, a really bad sign. It was only a matter of minutes before I would slip into a coma. That helicopter was gone. So I pulled myself up onto the jetty. And I'd hoped that my body was so cold that it might not actually register on a thermal camera. So it still gave me a bit of hope that I could get away from them. My hearing was almost gone. All I could hear was a kind of very high-pitched whine. All I could see was a very short space in front of me. Suddenly, a colleague who I was with saw someone move. Stop! Hey, stop! Hey, you there, stop! As we got close to him, he jumped in the water. Hey, stop! Get out of there! We both stood on the bank, shouting at him to get out, but he wasn't going to. Come back here. I jumped in after him. I pushed him against the jetty. I can distinctly remember him turning and looking at me. It's a look I'm not going to forget, because it was a look of, of a hunted animal that, that had given in, He'd completely given in. At that point, I didn't have any choice. I was just captured. <laughs> I was put in solitary confinement. My hearing and sight came back fairly quickly, but for days later, I was quite badly ill. I served another 16 years after the escape. 